Now, uh, our next speaker has joined the collaboration in, since just in August of last year. Um, and uh, Ruth Jepson comes to us, she's seconded to us part-time uh, as our senior uh, uh, research advisor, senior, what do we call you now? Senior, senior, uh, so, see, I'm not getting the lingo right this morning. Ruth uh, was a nurse originally and trained in, in public health at the doctoral level and has been a senior lecturer for some time with a, a lot of teaching experience and research experience um, at Sterling, at the University of Sterling, and she's been a tremendous asset to the team. This morning, she stepped into the breach to uh, summarize the results of our environmental scan that you'll see out on the table out there uh, because the people who've been involved in it are no longer working with us, as you heard, uh, and she'll acknowledge them, of course, but we're grateful for her willingness to do that. Ruth? Thanks very much. Um, well, yes, as John said, I'm here speaking on behalf of the team that produced this report that many will, of you will have seen. There's lots of copies available. And it was a review of interventions to address multiple risk behaviours. And I think um, Helen made a very compelling case just now about how risk behaviours cluster together and how maybe the best approaches are those that want, focus on more than one risk behaviour. I'm just going to start by giving you a wee bit of background to the Scottish collaboration and to maybe help you understand where the scan came from, where the idea came for, for this particular scan. We had this slide up earlier and John described us, but basically we're here to identify key areas of opportunity for developing novel public health interventions and to foster collaboration between government researchers and the public health community. And we mean public health in its, its widest sense. It's not just those working in traditional public health roles, but it's anyone that is involved in improving the health of the Scottish population. And we're also really, really interested in building capacity within that community for collaborative research, so with academics, with policymakers, and doing it themselves and between themselves. Now, the way we're organised is um, around working groups, and they um, are focused on particular topic areas, but they're organised around the life course, and we've talked a bit about this before. Um, so there's early life, there's the adolescence and young adulthood, which is where this piece of work and where we're representing today. There's early to midlife, and there's later life as well. And each of these groups has a researcher within our unit. We're a very small unit. There's only eight of us in total, but e there's uh, a researcher attached to each of these. I'm going to introduce one of them at the end for you, for the adolescent and young adult working group. So one of the tasks of the working group, the first task, and it's actually one of the first tasks of all the four working groups, was to identify a topic area to undertake a research review. They thought that was a good starting place to, to collect all the evidence um, that was relevant to Scotland. And the, the, um, the topic they chose was approaches and interventions to address multiple risk behaviours in young people. And some of the objectives of the review were to identify and summarise the Scottish, current Scottish Government policies that were relevant, to describe the overlaps in factors influencing mul multiple risk behaviours in adolescents and young adults. And this is, again, it's looking at the clustering. And what are, what are the things that underpinning that, the reasons why um, adolescents are involved in these risky behaviours? And I'm going to be talking a lot more about that later. And also, thirdly, and maybe perhaps most importantly for some of you involved in service development or provision, to try and identify just the effective approaches that are implemented in adolescence and early adulthood. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today. So here it is. There's lots of copies, as I said, available. And it's also available online. And the main aim was to provide a synthesis of, of what works to prevent multiple risk behavior for policymakers, practitioners, and academics. And similar to what um, Helen was talking about, it was focusing on four particular risky behaviours, tobacco, drug and alcohol use, and risky sexual behaviour. <coughs> this is just a bit of a framing and contextualisation for why they thought it was an important area to review. And as I say, Harry and, and Helen have already given us that. 
that risk behaviours such as alcohol, tobacco and illicit drug use and sexual risk taking are among some of the major problems facing our young people today. And what's important to sort of mention is that early initiation of a risky behaviour is associated with other risk-taking behaviours in later <coughs> adolescence and early adulthood. So therefore, the, the argument is that the pre-adolescent period and the transition from primary to secondary school can be considered critical periods where there's the opportunity to minimise exposure to risks and strengthen protective factors as well. Some of you may have seen this table before, but it's just to sort of bring home where we are in the UK in relation <coughs> to other countries. And if you look at the bottom line here, where I've got the red mark, that's the United Kingdom. Now, you can argue amongst yourselves whether Scotland would fare better or worse than the parts of the United Kingdom. But what you can see from this is that the dark blue represents where we're in the bottom third. And we're in the bottom third for many things. And in particular, we're in the bottom third for family and peer relationships. And hold on to that, because I'm going to come back to that later. And also behavior and risks. We're actually number 21 out of 21. <coughs> so we're at the very bottom for uh, our, 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 our well-being. And we're also quite low in, in number 17 for educational well-being as well. So it's a reminder that we do need to get better, really. We need to find effective approaches to help our children. Now, Helen's already uh, <clears throat> said this, but I'm going to reiterate it now. And it's quite nice to have someone that's gone before and said the same thing. But there's growing evidence that some risk behaviours in young children tend to cluster together. And that, so for example, in Scotland, data indicates that young people that regularly smoke are also highly likely to regularly take illicit drugs and drink alcohol. So why is this important? Well, this clustering and the recognition that many risk behaviours may share similar underlying risk and protective factors has led to the proposal, and, and Helen said this in her conclusions, that approaches and interventions should perhaps to be targeting multiple risk behaviours rather than just focusing on a single behaviour. So rather than just trying to reduce alcohol use or drug use, you should be looking at more than one health behaviour. And there's two types of approaches to tackling risk behaviours. So there's those that focus on tackling multiple risk behaviours, such as alcohol and smoking, or those that just focus on a single risky behaviour. Now, as part of this review, we did look at both types. So if you want to know more about the approaches to single risk behaviours, you can look in here. But for today, I'm just going to focus on those that tackle multiple risk behaviours. OK, so here's the findings from the review. As I said, first of all, they looked at the relevant Scottish policy, and I'm not going to dwell on this in much detail. Three of the main documents they found were Towards a Healthier Scotland, Improving Health in Scotland, and Health Promoting Schools and the Curriculum for Excellence, which is all about, it fits in well, it's all about a holistic approach to young people's health and well-being. And there's plenty of other Scottish Government policies relating to preventing or reducing risky behaviours. Some of them concern regulation, and we know about some of those already. And most of the actions relate to improved provision of education, information, support and treatment. So what I'm going to start off, and this is, sort of follows on from what Helen was saying, was trying to think of what are the underlying risk and protective factors for risky behaviours? And this comes from a lot of the evidence in the literature. And they tend to be grouped into four main categories, which is the individual, includes peers, family, school, and community. And you probably, you all know this, but the factors which lead young people to engage in risky behaviours are complex, and they're likely to span all of these domains. You're not likely just to find them in the family, but they're likely to be family, individual, and mixed between them. And also the factors aren't static. They'll change over their life course from a young adolescent to an older adolescent. Now... The reason why it's important is because dis different risky behaviours have different underlying factors, and so it's really important, and what we're interested in is look at the overlap. So where are the common risk factors and protect protective factors for multiple risk behaviours? What is the underlying sort of risk factors that are common to all of them? 
And why is that important? Well, once we know that, then that gives us an opportunity to help develop effective pro approaches to prevention, especially if we want to take a generic pro approach and we want to look at multiple risk behaviours. Now, this is just a partial diagram. The full diagram is in here, as I say, but what Caroline and everyone in the team looked at was they were just looking at what was the overlap, what were the factors that seemed to predict sexual risk behaviours and uh, substance misuse. And they found a number of risk factors that were common to all of them, and they were experience of authority care, low income and poor housing, availability of drugs, appears older than most, and a family history of problem behaviour. Those were the risk factors. They also found um, protective factors. And this is really interesting because this idea of connectiveness, that I hadn't, had no idea what Harry was going to say, but if you look at two out of three of the protective factors are about connectiveness. The school connectiveness academic achievement, and then there's family parent connectiveness. And they were common to all these risky behaviours. They were the what protected the children. Okay, so keep that in your head as well when we go on to look at interventions. So if we then group them by those four domains that I spoke about earlier, the factors that were common and that seemed to predict that a child was more likely to engage in, in risk factors that were common to all of them was the availability of drugs and low income and poor housing. In terms of family, it was a family history of problem behaviour and that was defined as drugs, drinking, verbal and physical abuse. And individual level factors were experience of authority care, the physical appearance and antisocial behaviour. Now, just going on to talk a bit more about what I meant by those protective factors, as I said, there was this issue about family-parent connectiveness, which fitted into the family domain. And what the researchers meant by this was this, this idea, it was about closeness to mother and father, perceived caring by a parent, satisfaction from the relationship with the parent, and feeling loved and wanted by family members. Those were what seemed to protect the children against these an overlap against for all of the risk behaviours. And in school, it was about academic achievement and this idea of school connectedness, again about connectedness. And what that meant was the perception of fair treatment by teachers, closeness to others at school, and a sense of belonging at school. Now, what's interesting is when you think about the risk factors, they overlap three domains. If I just go back, we've got community, family, and individual. When you look at the protectiveness, the protective factors, they only go over two domains and school comes into play. So it's suggesting that school and what happens in school is a really important predictor of whether children engage in risk-taking behaviours, and that's across all the four domains, as I said. I just want you to have a pause for thought. Sorry, some of you will be groaning at this. I know it's a very poor pun. But... Um, if you're thinking about your own work, or if you're thinking maybe about a service you're, de you're developing, do these findings resonate with what you see in your own work and with the people you work with and, and the young children? And what are implications do they have for the development of services or approaches if you want to tackle multiple risk behaviours? And you might also want to ponder, if you do have a service, do you focus on protective factors such as things like this, do you use any of these? Do these things, does that, that chime a bell with you? Do you focus on trying to reduce risk factors? And if you're thinking about what bits seem to work and don't work, can you see if you can unpick and think, well, actually, yeah, they focus on addressing that particular risk behaviour, or they don't. Um, so just have a think about this, and maybe over lunch you can think more about it as well and discuss it with each other. What I'm going to go on now is just talk about um, what we found in terms of interventions and approaches which seem to be effective across these four um, risk-taking behaviours. So it's, again, it's looking at multiple risk behaviours. Researchers always say this first bit. Research results were generally mixed. We always find this. But there were some things we could say that some studies had an impact on some behaviours but not others. 
There's sometimes there's a difference for boys and girls which suggests that we might have to... Uh, I was, I'm trying to think of a, another word for target, and I can't think of one, but we might need to tailor, tailor, that's a better way, um, our interventions for boys and girls differently. Or we might need to make sure that when we're looking at if they're effective or not, if they've got different effects for boys and girls. And some of them looked at short-term effects only. Now, for me, I think this is a problem when they only look at short effects because it's very easy to show an effect in the short term. But what we're looking at is we're looking at events that we want to change over the life course. We don't want it just to have a short effect from the ages of 14 or 15. We want to change behaviours so they'll go on to adulthood and they'll maintain those behaviours. So we're looking at maintaining a, a change in behaviour. So we took all these things into account and what we came up with was three promising approaches which had good evidence of changing both a sexual risk behaviour and a substance use behaviour. So they seemed to work across these domains, across these health risky behaviours. And they had some long-term impacts. So they weren't just looking at the short term. And these are published in here, but they've also been published, and there's more detail in this paper here at the bottom. And we've left copies out there on the, on the tables upstairs if you want to pick up actually the copy of the research papers as well. This is the first project we found. And I have to say they're all based in the US, so we need to take that into account. We're just showing you what the evidence says. We're not sure, we can't tell you how applicable it is to the Scottish setting, but I will be talking a bit about that later. So this was the Abai, Aban Aya Youth Project, and it was focused on preventing high-risk behaviours amongst African-American youth. It included individual, school, parent, and community components. Think about those four domains that I talked about earlier. It's, it's looking at all those. It's going across those domains. Those classroom-based le lessons covering top topics such as problem solving, conflict resolution, resisting peer pressure. So it's not knowledge-based. It's also about skill building. There was parent support reinforcing skills, promoting child-parent communication, again going back to that idea of connectedness. These are two completely <coughs> different bodies of research, by the way, but they seem to be coming together to give us an overall impression of what, what's really needed. And there was also a school and community-based task force to deliver the programme and influence school policy. And the results, they found that it significantly reduced substance use and recent sexual intercourse amongst males only with no effect on females. So why was that, that there's no effect on females? Well, the authors had two hypotheses. They couldn't test these out as to why it had no effect on females. But they hypothesized was one that um, a lot of the sessions were delivered by a male educator. So they felt that the males or the boys might have bonded more with that particular educator. So that's saying something about delivery of the intervention. But also they hypothesised that the levels were actually lower already amongst girls. So you were trying to get boys down from a high level to a low level. The second promising approach we found was called focus on kids plus improving parents and children together. Again, very stranger, it's about connectedness. It's about looking at fa a ch school, which was known to be a motivator or protective factor, and about families and family-parent connectedness, which we know is a protective factor. They were reducing substance use and sexual risk behaviours in high-risk youth. As I say, individual and family components. And they had group-level interventions, which I think were the classroom-based ones, to enhance decision-making, condom use, refusal and negotiation skills. Again, they were skill-based, not just knowledge-based. And they had a parental monitoring intervention, uh, which was a video and then discussion, role play and condom demonstration. And the results, they found it significantly reduced cigarette smoking, reduced pregnancy rates and increased condom use. Again, look, going across the domains, across the different health behaviours. The third one, which perhaps is most familiar to a lot of you, is the Seattle Social Development Programme, which is now called Raising Healthy Children. Again, individual, school, and parenting components. We had individual sessions based on improving academic achievement. Remember back when I said what one of the protective factors was, it was about academic achievement. So they actually focused on that, and it seems... So they weren't just focusing on, on the topic areas, they were also focusing on academic achievement as a way to stop the risky behaviours. 
the teaching refusal skills, pro-social beliefs regarding healthy behaviours. And they had multiple session parenting workshops, which were de designed to enhance parents' skills, decrease family management problems and conflicts. Again, we saw one of the risk factors were, was about being in a household where there was either verbal or domestic abuse. And then there was teacher and staff developmental workshops. This has been extensively evaluated. I think they've got something like 21 years follow-up. And they do start in the early years as well. It's, it's sort of throughout the school um, experience. So it's, it's going from early years into adolescence. And at age 18, they had significantly reduced heavy drinking, lifetime sexual activity, and history of multiple partners, and increased age at first sexual intercourse. And at 21, increased condom use, reduced pregnancy, and reduced multiple partners. Now, what I do want to tell you about is that moving on from that, this is a really exciting new um, development. It's, a, it's in this research project. It's in the final stages of negotiation with the funders. It's called the Social and Emotional Education and Development Programme, or SEED for short. And what, what it does, it's in, based in Glasgow, so it's a Scottish-based study. It draws on a gatehouse project in Australia. You can find more about that in our research review. And it draws on the social, Seattle Social Development Programme. So it's trying to apply some of the lessons learned from that project into the Scottish setting. And also it's the potential to incorporate with a third intervention called Growing Confidence. I don't know if any of you are here from that, that's been thoroughly piloted in Edinburgh. And just briefly to tell you what, about what they're looking at in terms of their three components. They've got a pupil's need assessment. They then get an educational psychologist who feeds back the results, which are aggregated, they're not to an individual. And they get the schools to reflect on the policy and practice and culture, again, going back to school connectedness, help, helping teachers to select initiatives and approaches and develop a commitment to positive change. And then they can deliver interventions, and they, I think they get to decide which interventions they choose, but you've got classroom packages, again, training for teachers and parents, and then whole school initiatives, which are about restorative practice and hopefully about connectedness as well. And then they'll implement these over three years. So in conclusion, it seems like the most effective or promising interventions for reducing mis multiple risk behavior is to target the underlying risk factors and protective factors that overlap all, all behaviors. To target one or more of the four domains, which is you know, the family, the individual, the community, and the school. To promote family and or school connectedness, that seems to be really important and to intervene early at the pre-adolescent stage and continue through adolescence. And again, I've got just about this supporting family connectedness as well. It's really important. I think people think, oh, it's just the peer groups, but actually families can be really important for teenagers. And as Helen said before, any approach will require effective cross-sectional engagement and collaboration, between, particularly between education and health sectors. And just a, an aside, really, that we need to recognise that social context is also very important. It goes across all the domains, really, that we, ha we need to look at availability and pricing of substances, cultural attitudes and social norms, marketing and media, access to leisure facilities, and the changing youth-adult transition, which is more complex and protracted. So in terms of issues that it might be useful for you to mull over during the day is particularly around these three programs, I showed you that they're all non-UK based and two are focused on African Americans. So how relevant they are, are they to Scotland? Having said that, we know that they are addressing what is known about the protective factors. And so it seems that there's something going on, even whether it's in America, whether it's with African Americans, that seems to affect young people. Secondly, and this is a bit of um, an advert for our organization, I suppose, is what do you know at the moment about current projects to prevent multiple risk behaviours in Scotland? Are you involved in one or do you know about one? Are they being evaluated? And secondly, I'd like to think about how you think research could help your practice or your development and delivery of services. I think there's a tendency for people to think that, you know, research is out there. It's for the academics. 
and not see it as integral to what they do and what you do as part of your practice. And I suppose what we would do is encourage you to think about research as being something that really can help you drive forward your, pro your practice. It can inform your practice. And it can part of it, and it can be exciting as well. Um, you know, you might have some really burning research issues or questions. You might be th have thought about things with and talked about things with your colleagues that you think these should be explored by researchers. Well, here's your opportunity to do so. Here's your opportunity to become and be involved in research. You can join our um, adolescent and young adult working group because that's where the policymakers, the researchers, and people like yourselves meet together. And they try and develop evidence based policy and policy or practice inform evidence as well. So if you do really want to become involved in research, either understanding how it can help your own practice or actually being part of the research progress process and trying to answer some of the research questions you have, then I would encourage you to sign up um, to our group. And upstairs, um, there's a table with a yellow folder. And if you just write your names in there, and at this point, I'm also going to just ask John McAteer to stand up, who's our research... Oh, he's there. John's our research fellow. He's only joined us a week ago. So don't ask him difficult questions. But if you, if you want to join the working group, you can contact John. You can contact John Frank as well, or there's myself. We've got another of our fellows, John Mooney, there. <laughs> Just... Like yeah, there's... We've got... <laughs> And I don't know if Rosemary's here. Yes, Rosemary's here. And Rosemary is the, the researcher that's involved with the early years group as well. So if you're interested in early years, you can talk to Rosemary. So we're all here. We've also got our meeting of all our working groups. We're all coming together in a big event on the 23rd of May in Edinburgh. So if you want to be involved, again, leave your details in the yellow folder and we'll contact you about the event. And you can also, if you just want to know more about what we do, what's the latest research, then you can join our mailing list. Okay, thanks very much. Thank